So I'd just like to begin the uh, 2013 International Workshop on Magnetic Particle Imaging. My name is Steve Conley, um, and I'm going to be delivering this. Welcome. So I'm very hopeful that you're going to find that this International Workshop on Magnetic Particle Imaging is as wonderful as last year's in Lubeck, or the previous one in Lubeck as well, in 2010. And I really have to thank you all for braving uh, a thousand miles of travel, especially when Lufthansa decided to have a strike and 700 flights were canceled exactly when you probably wanted to fly uh, to hubs like Frankfurt. Um, but it appears everyone was able to um, surmount these travel challenges and you made it to Berkeley and I really appreciate you making the effort to come here. One of the things I really need to do is uh, give credit. I'd like Emine and Robert, if he's here, to stand up. And I want to give a huge round of applause. <laughs> so everything wonderful about this uh, workshop is really due to Dr. Saritash. She did all, almost every bit of the organizing. She put in an incredible amount of effort the last year. Um, and Robert came on to our group very recently, and he's been an incredible addition to our group, uh, trying to organize a group that so far hadn't been too terribly organized, and he's doing a great, great job. And this is a special occasion to honor um, Dr. Sri Tosh. She's actually comes from Bill Clinton University, perhaps the single most competitive undergraduate university in the world. Um, where she did spectacularly. She went on to my old research group at Electrical Engineering at Stanford after that, and she worked on diffusion wave imaging in MRI with Dwight Nishimura. She's been working here in bioengineering at Berkeley and really pioneering some of the work on safety limits um, with magnetic stimulation in MPI. It's been wonderful to have her here. But she and her husband, Tolga, um, were able to land a two-body position at Bill Kent University. They'll be starting in the fall. And so maybe, maybe soon we'll have an international workshop at MPI in Turkey. Okay. So again, thanks so much to Dr. Sumitash and Robert Frawley. Thank you. <laughs> and also, we couldn't have done this at all without the financial support of all of these vendors. They were incredibly supportive. Um, we were able to make the conference almost cost um, neutral to everyone here. And it's really because of the generous support of Philips, Bruker, and all of these um, vendors here who really, really came out of their way. So do visit their booth, see what their products are. And, and um, again, we cannot thank them enough for their support. Okay, so why did you travel so far? Why did you fight the Lufthansa strike? It, it's all about magnetic particle imaging. As you all know, there's superb contrast. It's incredibly safe. There's no ionizing radiation. And the contrast agents are much, much safer, uh, especially for uh, a substantial subpopulation of patients with chronic kidney disease. It's processed by the liver, not by the kidney. And so therefore, patients who have compromised kidneys can actually use this agent, and unbelievably, it's actually used as a treatment for chronic kidney disease that have anemia. From an MRI standpoint, my own background is 20 odd years in MRI, and one of the things that is amazing is that the magnetization of the image in the superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles is 22 million times stronger than the nuclear paramagnetism that we typically image even in a 7 Tesla MRI scan. That's a very large number to start with, and, and you'll see some of the amazing feats of sensitivity of this new modality. Of course, this was invented in Philips Hamburg. We have Dr. Gleick, and, um, and I believe Dr. Weisenecker could not make it to this um, conference. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do at this conference was to invite specialists from other fields to come and see why we're so excited about magnetic particle imaging. Here are some of the scanners you're going to hear about at this conference. Um, this is from the Philips group, of course, where they have a mouse scanner and a rabbit scanner. If you look at the participation in MPI, it's also growing very rapidly and it's very exciting. 
You can see most of the groups are in Germany where it first started, but now more and more you've seen an international effort. Um, and so very rapid, very exciting expansion. And I'm very proud to say a new nation has come into the MPI world. We now have Texas as well. <laughs> and, and so the UC Berkeley MPI program, in addition to the program here today, we're going to have a tour of our, our laboratory, which has some unique um, scanners of our own. And we, um, it, we can have maybe three or four people at a time go through the scanner. And we've, we've set it up so there are lots of posters and lots of different things you can see. And, and so Patrick Goodwill designed all these scanners. And it, um, every year, we've been able to design a new scanner as we perfect our skill set in designing these X-Base MPI scanners. And you can see in uh, the Gertrude magnet and the Erna magnet, this is the world's only field-free line operating uh, MPI scanner that I know of. And this is a 7 tesla per meter field-free point scanner called Gertrude. These are some of the scans from this um, 7 tesla per meter 3D MPI scanner. And you can see with a 2-minute 3D scan, you, we were able to accurately diagnose air bubbles in this patient. You can see here. There's an air bubble. The patient did survive. Um, one of the things we've been working on the last uh, couple of years, Justin Kunkel, along with Patrick, have been working on using the equivalent of X-ray projection imaging to CT, using, of course, the filter back projection algorithm. So we do a, a regular, uh, we rotate the sample in that field-free line magnet that allows us to collect 2D scans that we uh, re reconstruct with the uh, 2D X-base a reconstruction method. Then after that, we go through the filter back projection algorithm. And this is a, it kind of looks like a MATLAB simulation, but this is real data from our scanner. And you can see excellent uh, conspicuity, and the fact that the radial resolution is a slightly worse than the axial resolution is a real consequence of Maxwell's equations. So we can take that data set, it's a 3D data set, and we can do a MIP, a maximum intensity, maximum intensity projection, it looks strange to say the MPI MIP because it, it looks like you're just switching the letters. And so, but this is what it looks like if we do those maximum intensity projections. And it's very important to demonstrate to those um, who are unaware that magnetic fields are transparent to tissue. And so we encase this in a tissue called Mealigris guapavo, which is turkey. And you can see on the right that we can image directly through that. And there's really only about a 1% signal change, and that's entirely due to loading of the RF receive coil. So these are experimental results showing the transparency of magnetic fields going through tissue. We're also, we have um, grant support through CERN, the Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and we're using this to track labeled stem cells through the body of an animal. One of the nice things, again, is we have this magnetic transparency, and you can see here about a million cells. They're black because they've been labeled with the reservist agent, and you can see here they're encased in chicken, and no longer can see them, but magnetically our signal is unaffected. You can see that we get a quarter of a volt, um, regardless of the presence of the tissue. This allows us to do perfectly quantitative studies anywhere inside an animal, you can see a suspicious looking correlation coefficient um, in the MPI signal as a function of the number of cells. We've also been able to do some ex vivo uh, stem cell experiments just injecting the stem cells that have been previously labeled into the um, muscles of this mouse after it was sacrificed. And here you can see 600,000 labeled stem cells and 400,000. So Bo Zhang is going to present this at the conference today. So we're in the very, very early stages of FBI. The reason I think that this is really worth developing, um, of course, we have to compare it to what's out there today. I would say the contrast is ideal. There's zero signal from background tissue. The penetration is ideal. As we've demonstrated, you can see through any amount of tissue. If we can build a scanner that big, we can reach through the lab. Um, the sensitivity is incredible. That 22 million fold increase in magnetization is a, just ideal for sensitivity. And it, as I just showed, it's quantitative. We get a signal that's perfectly linear in the number of nanoparticles at a given voxel. Um, you'll hear lots of talks about safety here, and it's totally non-invasive. The scanning modes, we can obey DVD-T limits just like an MRI, and the agent is completely non-invasive. 
And in particular, for the 25% of patients who present to the cath lab today, the x-ray angio lab, they really shouldn't be having iodine. And right now, we don't have any safe alternative. They used to use gadolinium, but that's no longer safe. And so now, um, I think that this agent, which doesn't go through the kidneys, it goes to the liver, could be a major advance. Temporal resolution is very similar to MRI, again, limited by DBDT. And the spatial resolution is going to be a major focus of everybody's work here at this, speak at this conference. So we were able to secure four incredible speakers to this year's conference. We wanted to cover some of the biggest, most exciting um, developments in the field. So of course, nanoparticles, the development of new nanoparticles that are instead of reusing agents for MRI, we want to use MPI tailored agents. And so Dr. Nyhaus from Hamburg is going to give a talk on that. Um, we all, everybody is excited about commercial development of new scanners. So we have uh, Bricker is going to talk about the very exciting development of a small animal scanner. And we have Dr. Bernhard Gleick who's going to talk about um, the human scanner and also how the safety limits will affect imaging speed. And we're incredibly honored to have Dr. Roger Tsien of UC San Diego, who is a professor here in the 80s at UC Berkeley. And he's going to, he is, of course, the Nobel laureate for the development of GFP. And just briefly, I wanted to cover some of his CV from the NobelPrize.org. Some of this is very inspiring, I think, especially for the uh, newer students. He was born in New York City. He did extremely well in the Westinghouse Talent Search. Um, he, his, he had two siblings who had gone to MIT, and he decided instead to go to Harvard, and was very happy there. He started out in chemistry, and I think he, little has changed in, in the chemistry courses because he found those courses so distasteful, he moved into many fields, and I'm, I bet he's um, very excited about learning all of those, uh, this physics and oceanography, molecular biology, and then he settled into a major in neurobiology, he then went on after Harvard to a PhD at Cambridge on a Marshall Scholarship, working in physiology. He did a postdoc also at Cambridge um, in England. And, and I think for all of you, especially postdocs entering the job search, I think this quote is especially inspiring. He says that almost all of his job applications immediately after his postdoc were unsuccessful because biology departments considered me a chemist, whereas chemistry departments rejected me as a biologist. Um, so, we were very fortunate in the 1980s to have Dr. Chen here as a professor in, in the Department of Physiology and Anatomy, and he's been at UC San Diego and HHMI ever since. So, I'd like it if we all give a big round of applause to Dr. Chen.